While no subsequent performance effects were observed and no between trial differences existed for blood lactate, salivary cortisol, or cognitive function or physiological function, uh, practitioners may wish to consider using caffeinated gum throughout halftime due to substantial increases in salivary testosterone over the halftime period. Blah, blah, blah. You can just leave it go and say there are no effects. So this week's paper is titled The Physiological and Performance Effects of Caffeine Gum Consumed During a Stimulated Halftime by Professional Academy Rugby Union Players. So this paper has taken us into the realm of, you know, variants of, of caffeine and different methods of administrating it. Uh, caffeine obviously is an incredibly well studied topic, especially in the realm of uh, sports science. So it's interesting to look at a different kind of method and see what kind of effects it will have on aerobic training. So what we had was 14 male academy rugby union players. They were doing a randomized placebo controlled counterbalance crossover study design. So a pretty, pretty standard design for one of these studies. So what we had was 14 males and they were doing a repeated bout analysis with a simulated halftime and then a repeated bout analysis again. So players were brought into the lab. They did pre-exercise assessment. Uh, they chewed placebo, and then they moved to the repeat about analysis, which included six by forty minute runs, uh, twenty seconds active rest in between each sprint. They then moved to a simulated, approximately fifteen minutes halftime bout, and there where they chewed either placebo or they chewed a caffeinated uh, chewing gum, which was worked out at approximately four hundred milligrams of caffeine. Per player so they went off body weight they then repeated the same repeated sprint analysis so which was 6 by 40 meters again and then with 20 seconds active rest in between each sprint so what was analyzed was blood lactate uh, salivary testosterone cortisol concentration in the stage of cognitive function and they used the reaction and stroke test right on to the results section then next the first thing we're going to look at is like physical function the main parameter here is sprint performance so you're looking for a difference between initial sprint performance and half time sprint performance obviously as we'd expect exercise had an effect on sprint performance so the second lot of sprints were slower than the first lot of sprints the difference between the first sprint in sprint one and the first sprint in sprint two was it was around three percent slower so it's basically people have done some work they're small but more tired they're fatigued it's as absolutely everyone would expect but the main thing we're looking at here is the fact that caffeine gum at the halftime break had no real difference. Next thing we look at then is some physiological markers. The first of these markers is blood lactate. So once again, exercise had a significant effect on blood lactate. So there is a significant increase in blood lactate from the start of trial one, so RSSA1, to the end of RSSA1. The other thing to note here is that these increases in blood lactate were still elevated to a significant level when they were starting RSSA2. So basically after a halftime break, they still had significantly higher blood lactate levels. Interesting to note here, caffeine had no effect. So what we might see if we have some increasing in capacity or increasing in ability to contract with more force or to have better endurance throughout multiple sprint bouts is you might actually see an associated increase in blood lactate here because more energy is being used, more ATB is being produced, but that didn't happen. There was just no effect from taking caffeine at the halftime break. Salivary testosterone then is the next one. It's important to note salivary testosterone has been linked, as I said in the quote at the very start, with increased voluntary motivation or increased voluntary muscle contraction. So salivary testosterone is a good one to look at. The main finding from this entire study is that salivary testosterone in the caffeine group is 70% higher at the beginning of the second bout of testing. So basically, Dave, everybody did the sprints. They had a halftime break, as Gurf said. Some people took a placebo. Some people took a caffeine gum. So you have a 70% increase in salivary testosterone levels in the group that took a caffeine gum. The final thing that then we look at is salivary cortisol levels. So cortisol is a stress hormone. You usually see significant increases in salivary cortisol when people are doing high intensity exercise. Caffeine gum had no effect here. So we saw the increase as people were exercising but caffeine didn't increase that more, or it didn't decrease it, it was just no effect. On to the discussion then. Uh, and the first thing is like why you'd want to take something at half time. So caffeine has a very long half-life. It also has a pretty short like absorption time. So if you're taking a caffeine supplement, by the time you get into like 45 minutes after taking it, 
those concentration levels in your blood are pretty high depending on your like administration technique it's going to be pretty consistent like you'll understand yourself if you're used to taking powdered caffeine usually for most people like half an hour to an hour afterwards you'll have the full effects you might start feeling some effects maybe 10 minutes later but physiologically you're talking about probably 40 minutes so then why would i need to top up at half time so caffeine has a very long half-life if you have somebody who has trouble sleeping and they drink coffee at like six o'clock in the evening thinking it won't affect their sleep the half-life of caffeine for most people is around six hours for some people it can go as far as 12 hours so that means half of the concentration is still in your blood at midnight if you've had a cup of coffee at 6 p.m in the evening so then we look at this group it's rugby players rugby matches are lasting 40 minutes aside for senior rugby games so if i take my caffeine probably 20 minutes before the game by the time i'm kind of hitting the game that caffeine is starting to have an effect but the half-life is so far away like it's it's if i take on 400 milligrams and that's effective when i start the game 40 minutes into the game that's still very very effective and the decay hasn't even begun to happen so it's not like this is going to drop off hugely because i haven't taken caffeine in 40 minutes like the caffeine hasn't even come into your system yet so that's the main thing i'd want to talk about here is like timing of these things and so people taking like sublingual solutions thinking that their glycogen levels have depleted when they haven't depleted any glycogen it's kind of the same thing here you don't need to top up on caffeine because the caffeine hasn't gone away like it's a stimulant it has very very positive effects for performance but you don't need to top up on it halfway through a game the second thing i'm going to talk about is the kind of motivational effects of taking a stimulant like this so interestingly, in that quote I read out, they spoke about the motivational effects, right? Uh, increased voluntary motivation. It's true, right? Rugby is a, a very difficult game. You're running at people, stopping them from running over you. It's basically a wrestling match that's happening at sprinting pace. People are very, very large athletes. There's a high pain threshold involved in being a good rugby player. So yeah, right, taking a stimulant, having some sort of perceived physiological stroke, quasi-psychological effect is going to be positive. And look, if that means taking it in chewing gum form uh, makes that psychological effect more beneficial than take it in chewing gum form. Like we have the examples of like high-level weightlifters who if they can get pain medication in a tablet, it's good. If they can get pain medication in a syringe, it's going to be better for them. So there is this kind of placebo thing here that like, oh no, I'm not taking my pre-workout, I'm taking caffeine gum, and that somehow taking this gum at halftime is going to give somebody a perceived spike in performance. Look, if you get a placebo effect from it, that's great. Like fucking hell, if Skittles give you a placebo effect, take Skittles. But this study anyway seems to show that there aren't really any underlying physiological pathways for success here and when we look at just the very basis of what caffeine does for us and the kind of decay profiles associated with caffeine there's nothing here so the big thing here right is the impact of testosterone so that was the we saw a meaningful change in testosterone after the caffeine gum was elevated so you look you won't hear from me saying that elevating your testosterone isn't a good thing that's not something that i'd be like well no jesus we don't want to rub union players with lower testosterone but uh, what we really need to think about here is like does this have a meaningful effect on people's performance in terms of does a short term acute increase in testosterone really have a meaningful effect on their performance and it doesn't look like it does from the sprint times but if um so if we look at like the kind of introduction of the paper there i'll just read a little quote from them uh, notably, acute increase in pre-exercise testosterone concentrations have been reported to enhance high-intensity performance thereafter, including game outcomes in rugby union. So, number 11. So, if we go look at their quotes so, or their, their reference paper. So, the paper they referenced was relationship between pre-game concentrations of free testosterone and outcome in rugby union. Uh, basically, that wasn't an interventionist trial, rather it was an observation. So, it was measuring... Basically, what they were saying was lads with higher testosterone are better at playing games of rugby. Uh, so not really a useful kind of comparison in this regard. So it makes sense that lads with more testosterone are going to be better playing rugby. So if we look at the concept of does acute increase in testosterone have meaningful effects in terms of performance increase? Probably not is the answer. So 
if we look at people who use performance enhancing drugs or people who you know take testosterone replacement or sports therapeutic doses increase their levels of like nanograms per deciliter of testosterone somewhere in the region you know up to 15 times or many more depending on what kind of dosage scheme they're using over a very prolonged period of time so we don't see people take uh, performance enhancing drugs for one game or one exercise bout we see them take it over the course of multiple different weeks to months even years to see meaningful effects on their performance at levels much higher than this so does an acute increase for 15 minutes have an increase in performance over a very short period of time once off the answer is very very likely no it's not no i'm not saying does this have a positive impact on the performance it doesn't look like it does from this study it's possible it might in other scenarios and we definitely won't say that it doesn't but realistically i don't think it has any meaningful effect if we look at what people do for like what meaningful levels of testosterone do to people over a long period of time and what this didn't show for them is like they didn't see an increase in performance now, that's not to say that we're arguing that caffeine doesn't have a positive impact on performance, absolutely. But does this method of caffeine administration have any significant or kind of special attribute that would make it better than consuming a pre-workout or caffeine? It doesn't look like it. There might be a scenario where, you know, for example, 400 milligrams of caffeine is a significant volume of coffee if you were to take it in that regard. So it would be somewhere in the region of three to four strong cups of coffee. Maybe, wait, say two to three strong cups of coffee. Uh, is it more pleasant is it a better system to take pre-game if you're looking for a minimum caffeine dose so something you always have before a match or preferably or more likely people watching this is between your own sport or between going to the gym does using caffeine gum have a less bloaty effect so you know you don't want to be taking three to four cups of coffee you probably don't want to be drinking a large volume of pre-workout they often have additive ingredients in them so things like beta aniline you may not want to get side effects of that you know they sometimes they have creatine like you don't want to be doping with creatine you just want caffeine so you'll take something like um caffeine gum you know you don't get a lot of extraneous ingredients you don't get a bloating feeling from it you don't have excess amount of uh liquid in your body so might be a better method to take caffeine to get the benefits of caffeine but i wouldn't come at this from the view that caffeine gum has any special effects i've seen people use it i've used it once twice myself it didn't feel any different to any other version of caffeine uh, caffeine is great for sports but caffeine gum no better no worse than the other form